Gentlemen, Tucker Carlson, today from the beginning of our nighttime show on Fox News, we've tried to invite on people with whom we disagree on a bunch of things, but where we agree on some really important things, where there's a meaningful union set of belief. We do this for two reasons. One, to show that partisanship is mostly an illusion designed to control you. The team sport of politics is a lie. They're not on your team. And the second reason is because it's super interesting and it reminds us of our common humanity and you learn things when you talk to people you don't agree with on everything. It expands you as a person. And what's the fun of living if you can't do that? The problem is a lot of people with whom we disagree on some issues can't come on because it gets so viciously attacked when they do. You're a white supremacist, you did that show. That's another means of control, obviously. So we're always grateful for the ones who do and Jimmy Dore is definitely in that category. He is first and foremost a comedian, he's also a I think a deeply incisive political commentator. He's hosted the Jimmy Dore Show, which streams on YouTube. And we're happy to have him in our studio now. Jimmy Dore, thanks so much for coming on. It's my pleasure, it's my pleasure. You know, I just like to tell people uh, who get upset at me for when I do your show, it's like, well, you shouldn't be upset that I'm doing Tucker's show. You should be thankful that Tucker brings me on to bring my anti-war message and my free speech and defense of Julian Assange to half the country. When you see me on Tucker Carlson, it should make you upset that I'm not on Chris Cuomo's show or Rachel Maddow's show exactly. or fake tough guy Lawrence O'Donnell's show. That, that, that's what it should trigger you, but they don't. They get triggered that I'm on your show, which is ridiculous. And it's, it shows that they haven't thought it through. And, you know, when people say that they want to organize along class lines, they don't understand what they mean when they say that. Class lines means everybody, means Trump voters, means everybody in your class. It doesn't mean half the country class. It means the entire country class. And that's what people don't understand. And that's how we have to organize now. And as soon as you do that, Tucker, you will be pilloried. I interviewed someone on the other side of the aisle and they came for me because they can't have people on the right. populist left and the populist right coming together to go against oligarchy, the military industrial complex and Wall Street. They can't have that. Well, that is totally true. And I'm not even, I didn't even grow up in that class. And, that, and I believe in that completely, that people's fundamental interests are probably economic actually. Yes. And um, a lot of this stuff is, is a diversion designed to prevent you from knowing that. You actually are from a working class background. Describe where you came from. All right, so I grew up uh, on the southwest side of Chicago in a really uh, blue collar neighborhood. I would say navy blue collar. And uh, my dad was a cop and I was the youngest boy, 12 kids. 12 kids? Yeah. And so we we're Catholic, of course. <laughs> you think? And uh, I went to Catholic school, you know, so my parents made sure they put us through Catholic school and all that stuff. So I got a good education that way. I also got the, you know, the crap beat out of me every day too, but uh, that was, that's another thing. I it made me who I am. So I grew up that way and I got- Why did you get beaten up? Uh, Cause if you grow up poor, poor people beat the hell out of each other, right? So <laughs> I went to, I would go to school, Catholic school where they would beat you at Catholic school, right? And then we'd come home and our parents would beat us at home and then we'd go to the park and beat other people. And uh, that's just how it works. The circle of beating. I hated getting hit as a kid, you know, and, and well, I do a bit in my, in my act about it. And now when someone hits their kid as a grown up, I never you know when you're supposed to step in, you yeah. know? And uh, one time I was in an airport and this lady's hitting her kid, he's like five years old and she's just wailing on him. And finally go, hey, why don't you cut it out? You're creeping everybody out, you know? And she goes, no, you have to hit them, make some good people. And I was like, well, how many punches would it take to make you a decent human being? <laughs> what did she say? Turns out 80. Anyway. <laughs> No, I had, I did, you know, and I have a brother who hits his kid and I go, don't you remember how much you hated getting hit? And he said, oh, I never hit him if I'm angry. Of course you're angry. What are you, a Nazi? <laughs> you have to be angry to hit somebody. <laughs> who is sitting around laughing their ass off? Oh, I can't wait to hit my kid now. I'm in such a good mood. <laughs> anyway. Um, how did he respond? So that's why, my, you know, he laughed, my brother, but uh, it, it, so that's how I grew up. I grew up in that kind of a neighborhood. I didn't really have any role models that did anything I wanted to do. Uh, what did, what did the, the people around you do, the men in your neighborhood do? So you were the cops, firemen, or criminals, yeah. <laughs> basically. <laughs> and um, so that was it. And uh, I even took the police test. That's how far it went. My dad, I was in college, right? I had gotten in college and I was home for the weekend or something. And my dad, oh no, it was in the summer. And my dad woke me and my other two brothers up and goes, get up, you're going to take the police test. And I was like, what? What? He said, like, you have to go take the police test. And I go, dad, I'm in college. Can't you wait for me to screw up first? <laughs> but he made me take it. 
And anyway, so I didn't become a cop. How'd you do in the police test? So this is interesting. They never gave me my score. Yeah. And uh, they, it, it, I don't know exactly why, but um, I, I, they didn't give me, they, I, I think it was if you scored too high, they didn't want you, or that's what I tell myself anyway. You're just too smart to be a Chicago police I officer. I was too smart. Of the 12 kids, how many became cops? So my oldest brother, Phil, became, so my dad's Phil, he was a cop. My grandpa, Phil, he was a cop. My oldest brother, Phil, he was a cop. And, uh, but then he's- All Phil doors. All Phil doors, yeah. So, and then my oldest brother, he quit being a cop and then he went into business for himself. But, um, so yeah, so that. Uh, but a lot of my best friends in Chicago were cops. State cops, Chicago police cops. And uh, so what I know What kind of cops. life is that? So I know cops. Um, they enjoy it. They enjoy it, you know. I didn't. Yeah. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want any part of that. My, you know, my dad was. He drove a paddy wagon, his whole life, and um, you know, he didn't really. I don't think he ever pulled his gun. He, he wasn't the kind of guy who went looking for trouble. You know what I mean? My yeah. dad wasn't gung ho. He was the kind of guy who got that job because he had kids and he needed to have health insurance and stuff yeah. like that. He wasn't like, let's go mess some people up. You know, he wasn't on steroids. Did you know your grandfather? Yeah, I knew him. Uh, he died when I was, I think, in third grade, second or third grade. Um, he was an Irish guy, drinker, yeah, and, and a cop, and he died right after he retired. And so that's what my dad, my dad, I think, was afraid he was going to die after he retired. So my dad retired when he was 57. So he worked two jobs his whole life. He was a cop and a tuck pointer, which is brickwork, and that's yep. what I did with him. So my dad had his own little company, and we would do brickwork during the day in the spring, summer, and fall. And uh, if you, that's really, if you ever want to ruin a relationship, go to do brickwork with your father eight hours a day. I can't imagine. <laughs> it's, as you're talking, one of 12 kids grew up in the city of Chicago, son of a cop, grandson of a cop, brother of a cop. I'm thinking it's, it's almost like a, it's almost like a cliche. But then I realize, I don't know if that world exists anymore. Um, I don't know what you mean when you say that world. I'm not sure what I mean either. <laughs> but it's, you're telling a story that, you know, seems like very American mm -hmm. and familiar. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if it still is. Is your, is your neighborhood the same as it was? You know, when I go back, it seems the same. It really, so I, I don't know if, uh, in my neighborhood was very interesting because they started to do public housing, right? And so they would do scattered site housing, right? Before in Chicago, the Mayor Daley, the original Mayor Daley's idea was you put all the poor people in one place, yes. put them in a big tower. Oh, yeah. And that's the worst idea. Cabrini Green. Right. Yes, that was the worst idea. Even when you have college kids in huge towers, they wreck the place. Not a good you idea. You don't want to do that, right? And so they started to do this thing called scattered site housing, where they would put public housing in every neighborhood around the city, and it came right in our neighborhood. Of course, they didn't put it in every neighborhood. They put it in our neighborhood, and that created racial tensions. And so I grew up... And that's it. There was a dividing line and the blacks lived on that side and the whites lived on this side and you weren't supposed to go across. But then eventually we did. We started to we organized football games against each other and we kind of kind of got to know each other. It wasn't like, you know, kumbaya, but it was kind of interesting that we did that and we could actually have football games and we wouldn't fight each other. And so that kind of informed me growing up and uh there was a lot of people who were like, you better not sell your house to a black person, right? That was a big deal. And I was like, people just say that out loud, you know? And my neighbor, so we had 10 kids and then we adopted to uh, a Puerto Rican and a Mexican in, in my house, right? And so I didn't grow up racist at all, right? I mean, we- Yeah, uh, I mean, by definition. Right, but in, uh, and, and it was- Why did your parents do that? They already had 10 kids. I don't know. I had a theory. My theory is when I went to school, um, my mom got lonely. I was in school all day. All her kids were at school all day. She doesn't know what to do all day. She likes babies. My mom wanted a baby. Another yeah. one. Another baby. So she went to Catholic Charities and she said, I want a baby. And they said, well, we don't have any babies, but we have this kid. If you'd like this boy, he's in third grade. And my mom said, sure. And so she brings home. So we have a, a guy, an, another boy older than me. I don't need another <laughs> older brother to beat the hell out of me. And he was a badass, tough guy too. And he did beat the hell out of me. And um, so it worked though. My mom was like, I thought if we got a boy, I would put me in good graces and I would get a baby. She got a baby. She had a baby that Christmas. And uh, my- She sounds like a pretty unbelievable person. She was, in a lot of ways, my mother was. 
and uh, she got the baby. My then I got to have a little sister, which I really enjoyed. I, I having a little younger sibling. I really enjoyed having a little sister. Now my little sister has triplets, and uh, so it was great. It was a, it was it was really I was I was happy. So you're still close to her. I was happy. Yeah, I love my sister. Oh, that's well, that's that's a cool story. Yeah, it was. I was I was really happy. And you know, it's funny. I remember when mom said, "Hey, we're going to get a baby." And I didn't want one because I didn't want competition. And I was like, I don't want a babe. No more. Let's have a vote. And Dad's vote counts for two. I remember I said that because I knew he didn't want another baby. And, uh, but we got him. And I loved her. I love it. It was great. Yeah, mom's vote counts for more than all yeah. the other votes. Yeah, so that's how I grew up. And I went to Catholic school. All my other siblings went to public school. But for some reason, I went to Catholic high school, right? I was the only one who went to Catholic high school. They all, we all went to Catholic grammar school. And then Catholic high school, I went to St. Lawrence on the southwest side of Chicago. Is it still there? Yeah, yeah. And they were a football powerhouse when I got there, so I kind of knew who they were. But uh, and it was an all boys school. Wow. Yeah. Not, mm. So then you went away for college. I went to college. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not really an, a student, you know that, right? So the way I picked my college, I went to Illinois State. Everybody in my neighborhood would go to Northern, and the reason I went to Illinois State was because my best friend Mike was going there, and he had a car, and I was like, I want to have a car when I go. <laughs> So that's it. So anyway, I only went there for three years and then I dropped out and I went to Columbia College in Chicago. It was just more of an art school and I was going to go into advertising. And uh, when I got out of college, I just started doing stand up comedy and they started paying me right away. And I was like, this is unbelievable. So I never got a job. You, you, I want to ask about that in two seconds, but you said at the outset that you've come on our show and people complain and you say, well, but CNN and MSNBC won't have me. And I'm thinking as I hear how you grew up, that there's probably not a single person at any level at either one of those networks who grew up close to the way you did. No. And so I, whenever- like That's I, a massive cultural divide, what you just described. And I've worked at both those channels, so I just know mm -hmm. there's, there's nobody who grew up like that. So I happened to be on some kind of panel in San Francisco a couple of years ago with all these news types. Some Emmy Award winning guy was, uh, was hosting this panel and I was on it. And- uh, and I was saying, you know, the reason, like he was asking what my success, what I attributed to. And I, I attributed to the fact that everybody's pro-war at all the major stations, at every newspaper, they're always for everywhere. And he's like, Jimmy, I don't know what you think we talk about in our editorial meetings, but we don't all talk like that. You think, and I said, I don't know what you guys talk like in your editorial meetings either. You know why? Because I'll never be invited into one of those editorial meetings, whereas you have been groomed to be in that meeting since you were in kindergarten and you don't even know it. Yeah, exactly. Because anytime you cross, you color outside the lines, that moves your little father outside that circle. You little, and I've been coloring outside the lines ever since I was in kindergarten. And so I'm never gonna get invited to that editorial meeting. And so now I have on the outside and I can tell you the truth. I'm a real outsider when it comes to journalism. So I can really call them out, which is why I have have such powerful enemies inside journalism. You do. <laughs> I've noticed. <laughs> I want to get to comedy. So you, 1989, which suddenly is a long time ago. Yeah. You decide to go into comedy. Yeah. Why? Well, I, first of all, I always wanted to be a comedian, but I didn't know I could. Like George Carlin was my hero. Yeah. And uh, I didn't think I had the talent to do that. I, that just seemed otherworldly to me. And then I saw TV shows. Uh, they had all these cable stand-up shows, and some of those guys really sucked. And I'm like, well, I'm not as funny as George Carlin, but I'm funnier than that guy, and he's on TV. So I bet I could do this, right? I bet I could do it. I won't be the best, but I'll be one of them. And so I was right. <laughs> That's a fairy. <laughs> I like that standard. I often feel the same way. I'm not a genius, but I... I'm better than that guy. I know I'm smarter than that guy. <laughs> Yeah, and so that was that, and I started doing comedy, and it was back in the boom, so it was 1989. Clubs were opening everywhere, and uh, lines around the block to get in, and I got to work with all my heroes, and I got, it was just amazing, and uh, it was an amazing time. And then in, four years later, boop, everything went the south. Comedy clubs started closing. They started cutting your money, and so I, that's when I moved to Los Angeles. I saw the writing on the wall, and I moved to Los Angeles to try to get on television, and it worked. Were you political then? No. No, I mean, um, I saw this guy named Bill Hicks. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Oh, of course. Okay, good. Uh, so he's the best comedian ever. Yeah, died at 32, I think. Very young. And pancreatic cancer, I think, yep. is what got him. And so I was pretty cocky. I was like, ah, I, I know what I'm doing in this comedy business. I know, what, I know how to do this, you know? Every time I get on stage, I'm like, wait till they get a load of me, you know? And then uh, I saw Bill Hicks. 
And like in the first five, 10 minutes I was watching, I was like, ah, oh, I started to get depressed, you know? And then at 15 minutes in, I started drinking. I was like, oh, I can't. And then after I saw him, I just wanted to quit because I know for the rest of my life, I would forever be chasing second place. I would never come close to So many professional it. comedians, you know, hi, the guys who work at the comedy store like you, mm -hmm. talk about Bill Hicks. What was it about Bill Hicks? That made him so remarkable. He he can you know his he can make concepts funny. He had these, uh, you know, he was a philosopher that was able to cut through and see things, and he could be blunt and hilarious and self. I mean, he had the perfect blend of everything, and he was an amazing performer. He was an amazing mimic. He he just had so much talent, and um, you know, he was uh, uh, an alcoholic for a while. Then he got sober. I didn't. I saw him when he got sober. So I didn't see when he was drunk and stuff like that. And I only saw him sober when he was on his game. And uh, there's just nobody, I just knew it. I just, I, I just like for the rest of my life, I'm gonna be chasing second place. And it depressed me and it really did. And then thank God he died like a couple years later and I, I was able to come be number one again. <laughs> oh God, that's dark. <laughs> so you made a that's... living more or less at comedy for more than 30 years. Yeah, yes. So you know the business really well. Yeah. I what happened to it? So, well, in the, in the early 90s, so it, it went down in the mid 90s because it just got oversaturated. It right. was on every television show. Had it, They would book stand-up comics on airplanes. That's what they, like they wanted. Physically? Physically, you were gonna stand up and do, I literally, I remember hearing about it. People did it. But of course it didn't work. And uh, so it was just got oversaturated and people left and they would have to give people free tickets to come to comedy clubs, right? And that worked for a little while too and then, and so then um, they, this thing called alternative comedy started in Los Angeles. I think that's where it started. That's where I live. And uh, it was a place called Largo. Um, and it was like people like Janine Garofalo and David Cross and, and those types, right? And, uh, and it, was, it, it wasn't formulaic comedy. Like you would kind of speak extemporaneously, yes. talk about your day. So it was more real and people enjoyed that. And the knock on it was it wasn't funny enough, right? Because it wasn't rehearsed and stuff. Uh, but now that I think that really opened up what comedy became. And then podcasts uh, is what then gave another boom to comedy, right? So then people were able to find their favorite comedians and connect with them in a real way. And then they could sell tickets and people. So that's, and for me, it's been YouTube has just been an unbelievable boon for me. Uh, like I said, I was telling you before, you know, I was on, ABC, NBC, I was on NBC at least five, six times doing stand-up comedy, CBS, ABC, Comedy Central specials. Mine was chosen best of the year by iTunes, thank you. And uh, it still didn't sell a ticket, you know? And then I started doing my Jimmy Dore show on YouTube and immediately I started selling out theaters. So co comedians by definition are outsiders. They're the people we give license to to tell the truth. And all of a sudden there's been this weird inversion where it's almost like we have court comedians who seem to exist to help the regime do whatever the regime wants to do. So, I, I mean, that's a very weird development, no? Uh, I, so, I like being an outsider. That's what comedians are supposed to do. That's what we're supposed to be. Uh, but I see now because of Trump, uh, comedians became establishment hacks and they're conformists. You know, no matter what the issue is, they're pushing the Democratic Party line as if that's some kind of way to stand up against fascism. And they don't realize that the Democratic Party is owned by the same people and that it's really a one party rule and that this is ridiculous. So I like the idea that I'm an outsider and I'm a real outsider when it comes to journalism um, because I'm not looking for a job in journalism. I'm not looking to make friends in journalism, and so consequently, it gives me the freedom to do and say whatever I want. And it turns out, when you do that, creates a lot of controversy. When you tell the truth about things, like when you call other journalists out for their McCarthy smears, uh, that causes a big wave of uh, controversy. So you were on a program called The Young Turks. Right. For how long? So I started working with them, I think somewhere around 20, 2009, maybe 2010. And Somewhere around you then. went for 10 years-ish. Uh, ish. I think I, I think I left early 2019, maybe. But I was, what, was, what happened was, after Hillary Clinton got elected, like, I couldn't vote for Hillary, right? Because I said, I'm not going to vote for warmongering. 
corporatists anymore and we have to put our, we have to draw a line in the sand and this is the sand line I'm gonna draw. And so I became, you know, there wasn't a good, they didn't wanna put that face out there. So they started, they put me behind a paywall and they took me off their Friday panels and uh, I kept doing my work and I thought, well, as soon as the Mueller report comes in, they're gonna stop doing this and we'll get back to being a news show again. Well, the report, they didn't. They just went even crazier. So uh, I left. And um, uh, I started doing this thing called Force to Vote, which in the middle of the pandemic, the idea was, let's have the uh, squad, the progressives that just got elected, that we all just helped get elected, let's have them withhold their vote for Nancy Pelosi as speaker, because the Democrats have a majority, but it's a slight majority, right? Like, and so now they have the power. Now Nancy Pelosi can't get elected without the votes from the squad. So the idea was, well, everybody for a generation has agreed on getting a vote on Medicare for all on the floor, on the left anyway. Yeah. And so I said, this is a perfect opportunity. Say, hey, Nancy, you'll ha you don't have our vote unless you promise to give us a vote for Medicare for all on the floor. Well, that revealed that there is no left in America because the squad wouldn't do it. They're not gonna oppose Nancy Pelosi, even though they all ran on it. And so what I'm trying to tell people is, that when you vote for them, when you vote for somebody inside the Democratic Party, no matter what they say, no matter what they believe, they're going to go along with Nancy Pelosi. And Nancy Pelosi goes along with Goldman Sachs and Raytheon. So when you're voting for someone inside the Democratic Party, you're voting for Goldman Sachs and Raytheon because they are not standing up to those people. So the idea that we have progressives inside the Democratic Party, it's actually more deleterious to the progressive movement to have them there. Why is that, Jimmy? Because it gives people a false impression that there's somebody in government fighting for you, that there's one of the parties that are kind of on your side, and they aren't. And the quicker people realize that, that both parties are not on their side, they only serve the oligarchy, we are in fact in an oligarchy, your democracy was stolen way before Trump, until that happens, we won't ever have real change. But what about Ocasio-Cortez? She's on Instagram. <laughs> Ocasio-Cortez campaigned on a floor vote on Medicare for All. And she campaigned on creating what she called a ruckus, meaning you have to stop being polite. This is a quote, you have to stop being polite. We tried being polite and it got us nowhere. And it wasn't until we started acting out and speaking impolitely that we even created the circumstances for change. That's what she tweeted. So I'm just doing what she said. So I started to put heat on people like AOC and Rashid Tlaib and Ro Khanna and all the, the, the Justice Democrats and the squad to force the vote. And they said I was committing violence against them with my words. That's how scared they got. <laughs> Were you? That's how scared. You really telling them to, to do what they ran on? That's violence? That's how afraid they were. And all the things, so they had people write hit pieces on me in the Daily Mag uh, New York Magazine, Newsweek, BuzzFeed. They tried to shut me down and squelch me. They made me trend on Twitter negatively, they, but they couldn't shut me up and they couldn't stop me. And they don't know what to do with me because again, all the usual, they have Wikipedia putting smears on me that I can't get rid of, CNN's calling me now. It's unbelievable what's going on. Just a comedian, a pothead comedian in his garage, what you can do when you want to tell the truth inside journalism and politics, and you can create a ruckus. And I did. And so now everybody sees that those people are fakers and they're corrupt. And the reason why I say they're corrupt is not because they take corporate money and do the bidding of corporations, but they're doing the bidding of their own career, right? Their own self-dealing. Yeah. So if I go along with the establishment, I'm gonna get a book deal, I'm gonna get speaking fees, and I'm gonna be in Congress for at least five years, and then I get a pension for the rest of my life. That is corrupt, and that's why they're not pushing back. Because Nancy Pelosi can come in and crush you. Hey, we'll fund somebody in a primary to your left just like she did to Joe Crowley, AOC, right? So that's what they're all afraid of. They're afraid of the power of the establishment taking away what little power and, uh, that they have in Congress. And so they're corrupted. And so I think people are seeing, they, they said, oh, we can't do forced to vote, Tucker, because we're gonna push for $15 minimum wage. And we have to keep our powder dry so we can push for $15 minimum wage, which Joe Biden ran on. So Joe Biden gets elected, they have, super, they have a majority, they don't push for, medic for $15 minimum wage or Medicare for all or get student loan default. No, they do nothing. They're doing nothing. It got revealed through force to vote and now the Democratic Party hates my guts. Have they called you a racist yet? Yes, they've called me everything. Oh, have they really? Oh yeah, I interviewed a Boogaloo boy, right? And so, which I didn't know anything about the Boogaloo boys. I don't either. I didn't know anything about, um, I thought they were like the Proud Boys, right? So I have this guy on and, He's 
he explains to me that the Boogaloo Boys were invented uh, as a response to the Proud Boys. And, the, and they thought the Proud Boys were racist and they were pro-cop and pro-war. And the Boogaloo Boys were anti-cop, anti-Trump, anti-Republican you know, Party, and they were pro-LGBTQ and pro-Black Lives Matter. In fact, he said, we give, uh, we give security for Black Lives Matter protests. And I was like, get out of here. I don't really believe that. Well, there's video I've been shown since that they actually did. But the problem is the Boogaloo Boys, they're like, they're not a centralized organization. So in the Northeast, they're different. In the Midwest, they're different. And so there's different groups. And they're pro-gun. And they're very pro-gun. And so I'm sitting there having a conversation with this guy and we agree on like five out of 10 issues, we agree on five of them. I'm like, well, why can't we work on those five things? You know, and they're like, no, you're a racist. You're a platforming a white nationalist. You're a platform. And I told you the next guy who, so I interviewed him and the next guy that came on my show was this socialist, or he's a guy from the World Socialist website. Yeah. And he was supposed to come on and talk about a strike nobody was covering. And he wanted to talk about how bad I was for having that Boogaloo boy on. And I said, yeah, but I, I know I used to think those things too, but did you hear what he said? He said the opposite. He goes, I go, what is your message? I go, now you're, a, you're supposed to be an organizer, a union organizer. I go, what is your message for a guy like that? A guy who's being crushed by capitalism, a guy who's anti-imperialism, a guy who's anti-political parties. What is your message for a guy like that? He goes, I don't have a message for him. I go, well, that's, that's why nobody ever heard of you. <laughs> Because that's not how organizing works. So I've been in unions all my life. You, you don't go to the shop floor and go, hey, who here is a Boogaloo boy? You're out. Who here is a proud boy? You're out. Who here is a libertarian? You're out. Who's a gun nut? You're out. Who's a trumper? You're out. Okay, who's left? Now we're going to organize against the man together. That's not how it works, right? When you organize along class lines, you organize along class lines around a central idea, and it's always economic, and you're screwing me. And so it's always economic. So that's that's actually why I first you came to my attention was you were interested in economics and foreign policy. And the conversation on the left revolves almost exclusively around identity, which is, in other words, me. Narcissism is about me. Yeah. But you kept talking about economics. That used to be the central conversation on the left or in America, actually. Yeah. Why? Why no more? Uh, because the establishment has learned how to co-opt identity politics to make to put the brakes on economic progress and justice. So they, the, so the joke I do, so if you want to, if you want to help, uh, I, I would say if you want to help black people, nothing would help them more than uh, free college, student loan relief, and Medicare for all, and a living wage. You want to help them? That would be the way to help them. Uh, but Joe Biden comes in, does none of those things, but he makes Juneteenth a holiday. So do you understand what I'm talking oh, about? Oh, I do understand. So that that's they're all it's all signals, but there's no substance. We're signaling that we want to help the minority community, but we're not actually helping them. So that's what identity politics is. It's a big diversion. And the joke I say, you know, if it was 1860, the Democrats would be bragging about their first transgendered slave owner. <laughs> <laughs> so you say stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, they must really hate you for sure. Yeah, but that's true. That dude, they do. They get they're, they're bragging about that they have uh, you know transgendered people as superdelegates and things. I mean, it's like what is going on? This is not you know there was a thing on Twitter where this liberal uh, news person I don't know who it was she she did this it was a woman and she said all the top ten CEOs making all this money right it was gross amount of money that they're making and I thought the point was going to be about income disparity and her point was where are the women. She was like, she wanted women to be rapacious oligarchs, too. That was the problem, that there weren't enough women doing that. I, you know, it's and now now women are the heads. They're the heads of weapons companies. Right. It's awesome. I did a whole thing on like all the big weapons companies manufacturers. Now they have female CEOs. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> <laughs> so that brings us to, to foreign policy, where you really have stepped outside the lines in fact, I think you live outside the lines. I think you set up a, a permanent encampment outside the lines. So to kind of give our audience some sense of what those lines are, we just have a quick montage of four or five familiar TV people responding to the latest bombing campaign in oh, Syria, which great. was this spring in March. Uh, and here's how they greeted it. Uh, I do think it was important for the Biden administration to send a message, uh, a very clear message early on 
that these attacks on our forces will not be tolerated. We're going to take a proportionate response, that we're going to respond. Um, and we hit back at them. And I think it, it's just sort of resetting expectations that if you hit at us, we're going to punch back. No one likes to talk about the fact that we have to protect ourselves, but that's the national security reality. And I think the Biden administration understands it and they're acting accordingly. I think that uh, that President Biden is pursuing a, a tough but smart approach. Is it a mistake to target bases in Syria right now? Actually, it was pretty smart. This is counterterrorism. So I don't think the Biden administration needed new permission or authorization from the Congress. My favorite is Jeremy Bash saying we need to protect ourselves. Really? What are our interests in Syria exactly? Do you know? <laughs> you know, um, I love that it's all new ways to keep the war machine going. They have to invent criminal. I mean, they have to invent monsters and boogeymen. And my favorite thing was one that, not my favorite thing, but one of the best examples of this was the, how they got us crazy about ISIS. They, Chris Matthews would show videos of the beheadings, right? And it was like, oh my God, you got to, the president has to do something about, they have kitchen knives, you know, that we're supposed to be afraid of them. They have kitchen knives and they're going to cut your head off with a kitchen knife. And I would always say, yeah, why don't we blow their heads off with a nice Christian bomb? What do you think? It's just nuts, right? So that's how they keep it going, right? It's like, uh, and why are we in Syria? You tell me why we're in Syria. Uh, a lot of people have a lot. Of, it certainly isn't because we want to help the people of Syria. That's what people say. Oh, we have to bomb. because Assad is a monster. Yeah. And we're anti-monster. And wherever monsters exist, we slay them. I mean, yeah. Kind well, of I mean, I, I felt that way ever since I found out Assad developed a worldwide torture program and centered it in Guantanamo Bay. And then, it, you know, invaded Iraq and killed millions of people. Did the same thing in Libya. I mean, that Assad is a maniac. Oh, wait, that wasn't him. Who was that? <laughs> so the, la the, last, um, the last administration had a couple of bombing campaigns against Syria. And the very first one was justified by a chemical weapons attack within the country. Mm -hmm. and we were told, um, like immediately, even before inspectors reached the site, mm -hmm. that this was a chemical attack by the Assad government against innocents. And that was repeated universally by everybody. Again before they even reached the site to verify it had happened, mm -hmm. you were one of the only people in the entire media landscape who doubted that story. And you did it in public. What happened next? Well, when I doubted it, I was on a panel on the Young Turks with three people, and they were all pro-war. And they were all trying to figure out ways, well, Jimmy, when, what, what circumstances, what would it take for you to be for bombing Syria? What if this, what if that? I'm just like, well, what if it helps me? I'm like, I don't know what you think, but Barack Obama doesn't care about the people in Syria. The reason why he bombed Syria isn't because he's upset that somebody got killed with a chemical weapon, 50 people, by the way, or whatever it was, that got killed. I go, this, this is obviously uh, to get us to want to bomb them and to manufacture consent for war. And they would all go, no, it's this. And, and I'm like, well, if we're going to bomb to help people, why don't we bomb North Korea? Why aren't we bombing Russia? Why don't we bomb? And they're like, well, we can't do that because they could hit us back. And I'm like, so you want to bomb countries that they don't have the ability to bomb us back and kill innocent people to help innocent people? And like, I'm just throwing logic at them. And they didn't like, I don't know. I go, how many innocent people are we supposed to kill in Syria? Oh, I don't have a number. That was a re <laughs> actual. And so that's what happened. And that's that. And it just kept going. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And that was right after we did Libya. Right. So, I mean, how you see Iraq, you see Libya. And, then, and by the way, they're still misreporting Libya. You know, they don't care. I mean, the mainstream news. And uh, can you summarize what happened in Libya? So in Libya, we all got uh, the NATO powers like France, Britain, the United States. Uh, they overthrew Gaddafi and they instituted a, uh, a failed state with open slave markets that is run by terrorists. And then they use a lot of the weapons from there. They funneled those into Syria. And a lot of those fighters up, they helped go. Yeah. So, so there was a reason there were so many CIA contractors in Benghazi. Yeah. You're saying. Yeah, I'm saying. They were moving weapons yeah. into Syria. Now, these are conflicts that the average so American timbers, doesn't know exist, right? Right. So there's timber sycamore. People don't even know about that, right? So it's you could look it up. Uh, it was the CIA uh, would give uh, weapons and money to terrorists to go try to overthrow Assad. And they've been trying to overthrow Assad they, since uh, at least 2006. I have an interview with Assad and uh, Christina Amanpour, and she says, you know, a lot of people are talking about regime change. This is in 2006, and they try to make it look like the regime change started with the Arab Spring, which it didn't. That's not how this started. This started as the CIA did this, right? 
So, and people don't realize that. That's what the CIA does. And no one will say why they really want to go into Syria, why they really, but they wanted to overthrow Syria for a long time. Some people speculate it's because they want to put a pipeline through Syria. And uh, I've seen that, and I wouldn't doubt it. Uh, that that's why they want to do it. A lot of people say because of uh, uh, Israel's interest in there. Uh, so there's, I'm sure it has to do with Saudi Arabia and uh, Israel. So it would, I, I mean, I have no idea, but it would be worth knowing why, I mean, Americans have died there, by mm -hmm. the way. Lots of Syrians have died. We prolong the agony of that country's civil war, obviously. So you'd think like the, the role of journalists is to, is to find out, maybe not take a position even, but just like bring the facts. And yet... The response has been like this. This is Brian Williams, who I believe is smart enough to know better, responding to a Syrian missile strike. Watch. We see these beautiful pictures at night from the decks of these two U.S. Navy vessels in the eastern Mediterranean. I am tempted to quote the great Leonard Cohen. I'm guided by the beauty of our weapons. Um, and they are beautiful pictures of, uh, of fearsome armaments making what is for them a brief flight over to this airfield. What did they hit? Now, I'm just sad that Sigmund Freud is gone because mm -hmm. the psychosexual analysis mm -hmm. of that would be super interesting. Yeah. You look at these beautiful missiles. To, I mean, like, I don't even know what to make of that. What do you make of that? Uh, I mean that they're, they just grow up with this reverence for war. It's like the, the only... It, it, the only knowledge they get is from uh, World War II movies. You know, right. it's like, did you, have you not watched Private Ryan? If you're going to do that, watch Private Ryan, you're going to understand what war is really like. And then you wouldn't be cheering it on because it's horrible. Right. And so but they do. They cheer it on. And, they, you know, they said uh, on CNN, that's when he became president, because when he bombed. Right. So Americans love bombing other countries. I don't know. I mean, the established. Why do you think Brian Regan? I mean, Brian, how do you think Brian Williams got that job? He didn't get that job because he was skeptical of when we bombed people. He got that job because he cheers it on. It just feels like such a perversion of his job. I mean, if you're a spokesman for General Dynamics, I mean, that seems like a legitimate position. You know what I mean? Our missiles work. Got it. But if you're a news anchor, Tom Brokaw got an award from a military institution. Right. He, I forget now I, it's, I'm blinking on the name of the thing, but like well, I don't know, some war college or so they gave him the biggest award you could give a guy. They gave it to a journalist. Are you kidding me? They should hate him. He's supposed to be exposing all the lies and the wars and the things. And of course, he does the, uh, the greatest generation. How about the generation that screwed us? How about that? The generation that took it all for themselves and set up a system that leaves 80 percent of the workers living paycheck to paycheck. Fifty percent of Americans can't afford a four hundred dollar emergency. How about that? That generation. Tell me about that generation. So anyway, that's that's how bad. Yeah, you're right. It, it, but uh, Tucker, how do people get to be an NBC? How do you get to be on television as a I, I would never be as soon as I said something, they would fire me. As soon as I told the truth about Syria, as soon as I told the truth about whatever, I would get fired. Right. It, I don't know. It's it's just so interesting. So I have strong feelings on foreign policy, which are basically out of step with the party that I generally vote for, which is the Republican Party. And the leadership doesn't, you know, they're they're right. way on the other side. So I kind of assumed that my views were very unpopular among our audience. I'm just being as honest as I can be. Mm -hmm. So I see you, and I and I think, well, I'm sure, you know, we don't agree on a lot, but I absolutely agree with what you just said, and I really admired your bravery for saying it. So I thought, let's have Jimmy Dore on. So we have you on, and I was stunned by the reaction. So our producers keep a pretty, you know, it's mm -hmm. sophisticated. Like, we know who's watching and what they mm -hmm. like and what they don't. You can tell in the numbers. They, our audience really liked it when you mm -hmm. came on. I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked by that. So it does make me think, and these are people who I bet have never voted for a single person you voted for. So it does make me think that some of these ideas are like a lot more popular than you would know from watching conventional media outlets. Right. You would never know. You would never know there was a big faction of anti-war people in the country watching the mainstream news media. Ever. You would never know that. You wouldn't even know there was an Occupy Wall Street movement happening for at least the first two weeks of it happening. Those people had to drive through it on their way. I remember I was watching MSNBC and they were... Uh, looking out their window going, what do they want anyway? I don't know, why don't you walk the 15 feet and ask them? <laughs> They're not gonna do that, Aaron Burnett. But um, did you ever see the study, and I don't know the name of the genius who did it, but he just went to a nexus and found that after 2012 when Occupy Wall Street emerged, 
the rate of the use of the word racist in the New York Times, USA Today, and the Washington Post went up by like 600%. Really? Yes. I know that. Okay. Yes. It's not proof, but it suggests what's really going on, which is all this, you know, a lot, not all, there's racism, it's worth talking about, but the focus on unsolvable race problems was designed to keep you from talking about solvable economic problems and the distribution of wealth in the country. Well, I think that's, I don't know if that's 100% true, but it's certainly partly true. For, exactly, I don't for think real. it's 100% true. Right, so like, but the, re the response to Trump wasn't how can we make people's lives better so they don't vote for a guy like that right. again. Right. <laughs> the response was, we've got to let everybody know that he's only there because of racism and everything else is fine. And that's crazy. I mean, I would be at these Hollywood parties right after Trump was elected, and I would be like, you know it's because of economic pain in the country. They're like, no, this is racism. This is 100%. And I'm like, come on. Trump didn't invent racism. Three out of the last four RNC chairpersons had to apologize for the Southern strategy. They had been doing this forever. What are you talking about? Ever since the parties realigned after civil rights, what are you guys talking about? They've been doing this. This isn't new. The, the thing that is new is that we're now voting for a TV show, game show host con man because we're so desperate. That's what's new. And they didn't want to hear, and they still, that's when they did Russiagate. So it, it's got to be racism and Russiagate. It can't be economic pain. It can't be the fact that people can't pay their medical bills. Right. It can't be that GoFundMe is our health insurance. It can't be that in the richest country the face of the earth has ever seen. And I ask people, what do you call an economic system that takes the richest country the earth has ever seen and renders half of its population poor or low income? You call that a failed system. And people need to recognize that we're living in a failed system. We've got the wealth. They just gave five trillion, the largest upward transfer of wealth in human history. And they got every progressive to vote for it, including Bernie Sanders. We are living in a failed system. No matter who you elect, it's not going to make a difference. So the quicker people realize that there are political system is 100% corrupt, rapacious oligarchy, and that we have to have direct action and get in the street, which is what always gets things done, right? When we got civil rights, Martin Luther King, you got to get in the streets and you got to make things happen. If we're going to have uh, 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 health care, we're going to have education, we're going to have a living wage, we're going to have to make them give it to us. Power de uh, give, uh, gives you nothing unless you have a demand. I don't but know how that's that the opposite of what I see, though. I mean, if so... It's pretty clear in every society I've ever read about, change happens when the upper, the professional class decides to bring change. Because actually, people who are living paycheck to paycheck don't have enough power to affect change. And honestly, over they don't, okay? So that would mean college students, you know, people who have a, an actual shot of getting a job at McKinsey. They're the ones you need on board if you want change, because they will be running the country. I've never even met one who's interested in any economic question whatsoever. So don't, isn't the- Have you noticed this? Yes, I noticed this. They're all a bunch of Pete Buttigieg's, <laughs> right? <laughs> Assuming we're pronouncing that correctly. Um, so yeah, they're all, the, they're all just different shades of the establishment. That's all they are. And, but I thought we had to, you know, like FDR, right? So FDR, he didn't bring socialism to America. They say he saved capitalism. And the way he did it was he told his rich friends, if we don't give them some of our money, they're gonna take all of our money because he had just saw the revolutions that had happened in the world. And so he said- His that, cousin, Teddy Roosevelt, same thing. Right? And so he figured that out. You gotta give people, so he gave them social security and they give, you want a job, I'll give you a job. Why doesn't the government do that? Why does the government, instead of giving you welfare or whatever, say, hey, if you want a job, we'll give you a job. Go give it, and then, so there's no reason that you don't have a job because we're gonna give you a job. We can do that, we have the money. Again, over and over we prove that we have the money. You know, it would take $20 billion to end homelessness. You know they increased the military budget by $20 billion already under Joe Biden? They could have did it, they could have ended homelessness. Well, so wait a minute, let's go back, that's such an interesting point. So the, the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps was the largest mobilization ever in American history during peacetime. Douglas MacArthur actually ran it at first. And they built the infrastructure of our national parks and they built, you know, they're yes. everywhere. To this day, it was 90 years ago, mm -hmm. we did a wonderful job. Yes. You know, every stone barbecue at a pullout mm -hmm. in a national mm -hmm. park was built by those guys. And they were young men who didn't have jobs, they got jobs. No one even, can, and I think it was an amazing thing that they did, it was useful. And it Very. gave dignity to people who did it. Yes. And it gave them money. Yes, and it stimulates the economy, demand side economics, not supply side. So, but, but the, so now you've had a lot of hurting people after the COVID shutdowns. I mean, indisputably, a mm -hmm. lot of people with like no money, they couldn't work. 
Instead, we just write them checks, which is better than letting people starve, of course. But why didn't anybody say, let's give people skills, dignity, jobs, rather than handouts to which they become dependent? I don't know, maybe because that would, I don't know, I'm speculating, but maybe they don't have jobs programs because that would raise the wages of the regular workers and put economic pressure on uh, private employers, right? So now they have to compete with these people who actually have an alternative. So right now they're getting unemployment and a lot of employers are saying we can't get people to come work. Yeah, because you pay shit and you offer no benefits and these people have a better life on unemployment. What does that tell you about our system, right? So. Uh, yeah, that's why they don't want to have that. I mean, that's my speculation why we don't have a good paying jobs program in the United States. Why don't we? It's certainly better than sapping the life out of people. But I mean, you don't want to be idle. Every time I've been fired and I don't have a mission or a purpose, it really degrades how you feel about yourself. I don't know if you've ever been out of work, but it's yes. not good for you at all. At least for a man, it's, it's not good for you at all. Well, like, at all. Not only that, but the stress of poverty, they have done studies that shows that the stress of poverty actually reduces your IQ, right? Because you're stressed. Right. And so that they're like, people are like, why do poor people make poor choices with their, uh, with their money? And it's like, well, one of the reasons is because they're stressed because they don't have money and they don't know how to, and so they make bad decisions and they've proven this through, and so we need to take the stress away from those people. We need to give people, you know, healthcare, a living wage, and then they can start living up to their potential and they won't have that kind of stress. Uh, it's, and we could do it so easily. We could get rid of student loan debt. They just gave a trillion dollar tax credit under Trump. Trump, they would have got rid of the student loan. I mean, they, they could do these things, but they just don't want to because those people who are in the positions of power, they came from McKinsey and they have no association with people like me. They have no connection. They have no idea what life is really like. You know, they've done those studies. The richer you get, the less you have the ability to see the emotions in other people's face. Do you ever see those studies? No. Yeah. So if you're, you know, a millionaire for a bunch of years, you won't, you get less and less able to tell people's cues of emotions through their face. It's amazing that it happens that way. I hope that happens to me. Sometimes. How much of your politics derived from Catholic social teaching that you learned in high school? Um, I, I don't know. I just always had a sense of you know, that there was economic injustice. I just always saw it. And, um, and I, I, I always, you know, I always thought that um, I lived, I saw the effects of racism in Chicago where I lived, right? I saw how they treated them, how they tried to, uh, to cattle them, house them and get them away from everybody. And I saw the way the police uh, treated minority blacks and, um, so I just always had an inner sense of it. And my parents were, were the opposite of that kind of, so in my neighborhood, people would use the N-word all the time and stuff like that. And my parents weren't like that. You know, they were, they were the opposite. My parents, you couldn't do any of that in the house and all that. And, and so they were really good people. So I had that. Uh, and my, I just had a sense of, you know, I saw my dad had to work two jobs his whole life. And of course my mom worked her head off. And I just saw everybody in my neighborhood work their head off, you know? And, and I saw the rich people not working at all, you know? And so I just always had this sense of it like that. So I don't know where if it comes from Catholicism. I kind of rebelled against Catholicism. Um, but yeah, so I, I wouldn't really chalk it up to Catholicism. What, I, last thing I want to ask you about is, is your job. And you've said, you know, there's no chance that you could get a gig on NBC. You can't even get on MSNBC, <laughs> no. right? And they're getting um, ready to kick me off YouTube. You well, so that's my question. You work on, I mean, you do live shows. Yes. And always have. But, you know, you make your living in part, at least on YouTube. What's that like? It's scary because right now the head of YouTube is not on our side. Like, it's not YouTube. She wants you to go to corporate news. So the head of YouTube did an interview where she bragged about that. They call independent news borderline content. That's what they call it. And she bragged that they had suppressed us 80%. So I used to get 16 uh, to 18 million views a month, and now I'm getting six to eight million views a month. So they're, so they're suppressing us, right? And e even then, we're still breaking through. So, and it's scary because they are, if, once they want to take you down, they can go get a video from five years ago and say, this violated our standards and our new standards, and so we're going to take your channel down. They're doing that left and right. And again, it's, it's about, there's certain sensitive topics, right? You can't talk about foreign war. 
You can't tell the truth about the military. Uh, you can't talk about uh, vaccines. That's for sure. You, it's, they've been taking people down left and right. So Matt Taibbi even wrote an article about what, how come we don't have free speech around health care? And why do we, what is this? So why is that? Why do you think you can't talk? And what would you say about vaccines if you could? Because you can here. OK, well, uh, I would just tell what, what happened to me. Uh, I would talk about ivermectin. Well, what happened to you? So on April 17th, I got my second shot, Moderna shot, and I never got better. Uh, had you had COVID before? No, I never had COVID. I, uh, I had an underlying condition, so my doctor recommended I get it. It's experimental vaccine, which I'm, I was wary of, and I didn't want to get it because I've exposed Fauci as being a liar on my show pathologically. And so I was not into it. And of course, I'm, I'm skeptical of big pharma. Like we should be. Yeah. And uh, but I went to my doctor and I and my doctor was like, no, you have this underlying condition, so you better get it. And so I followed my doctor's advice and I got it and I never got better. What does that mean? You never got better. So I have some flu like symptoms, joint pain. On the fifth week, my neck got stiff and my producer of my show had the exact same thing. And the, at the fifth week and I'm like, well, this obviously. So I look it up. I Google it. Oh, this is a thing. And that it, it happens on the side that you got the shot. I got my shot on my right side, my tip. He got his on the left. And, then, and that's when I tweeted about it. And I go, hey, it's been five weeks and I'm still experiencing all these things. And then a doctor contacted me who's been working with people like me. And he said, yeah, there's thousands of people like you. We have this thing. We think it's the spike protein, blah, blah, blah. And he said, call your doctor, go to your doctor on Monday, have your doctor call me and we'll have a consultation. Uh, because my doctor had to prescribe for me. And so my doctor, when I sit down and I start telling my doctor about my problem, my doctor looks at me and says, I'm treating five people just like you. One of them is a neurologist and one of them is a nurse and they're both afraid to talk about it because they're afraid to be stigmatized. That's how bad it is. That's how politicized medicine has gotten because of the, uh, the Democrats and Trump is that doctors and nurses are afraid to talk about the symptoms they got from an experimental vaccine. And so when I went on Twitter and I talked about this, people were calling me a faker and they were calling me anti-vax. I'm like, no, I got the vax. <laughs> I got the vax. How could you call me anti-vax? They think I'm making it up for some kind of crazy reason or something like that. That's not how science works. You don't tell people who are taking an experimental vaccine, keep your reactions to yourself. No, you're supposed to tell people so we can make the vaccine safer. They have to know what's happening. And so, but that's not the world we live in. Like I said, the left became a bunch of authoritarian conformists. And so anything that goes outside that, that punctures their bubble, they don't want to hear it. It's crazy what's happening. But I should even be nervous to talk about my reactions to a medical treatment that's experimental because I'll be stigmatized. And that's what people are going to do. And that's the world we live in right now. Well, you're the wronged party in this, unless I'm missing something. That, no, I am the wronged party in this. And nobody's going to talk about this. So right now I'm taking ivermectin. I have to take fluvoxamine, which is an antidepressant, for inflammation in my brain. Uh, so, And do you believe that is from the vaccine? I didn't have it before. Yeah, my doctors think so. That's what my doctors are saying. My doctors think that's so. That's insane. Uh, there's a lot of insane things happening. But I mean, this is happening at scale. So, I mean, there are like more than 100 million people who've gotten this, and a lot of them have been pushed effectively against their will into getting it. I was talking to a young lady, I forget her name, when I got here, and I was telling my story, and I said, how was yours? How, how, what happened with you and your vaccine? And she said, oh, I didn't have any problems. I just was sick for a week. Oh, wait, you know, I do have, I never had headaches before, but I get headaches all the time now. That was just what I got here. She goes, oh yeah, I get headaches all the time now. So I don't, maybe people aren't connecting the dots, maybe people aren't talking. I don't know, I think the more people talk, the better, because that will help science. Keeping your symptoms and your reactions to an experimental vaccine secret is not going to help science. What, I just have to ask you, what, what do you think this is about? I mean, what, why is, you think that's right? Ivermectin is generic. Ivermectin is generic, and they can't make that much money off it. So, and ivermectin actually works as a prophylactic also. Yes. And so in Mexico City, I covered this. No one else is covering this. They had their hospitalization rates in Mexico City were skyrocketing and they didn't know what to do. So the mayor of Mexico City gave an ivermectin pack to everybody in Mexico City and everything went that way. And so they're not reporting that, are they? But why would media, I mean, that's such an amazing story. Who, who, it's just an amazing, like leaving aside the, mor the, the moral implications of it, it's just like, 
that's amazing. Like, why wouldn't you report that? Why wouldn't you report that, yeah. Tucker? Uh, well, I don't know. Why wouldn't you report uh, what Bill Binney said about the hack of the DNC server? You know what I mean? Why don't that you the Russians did it? That he said they did it. They said it had it was a local thing. It wasn't. So why why aren't they? Because there's no money. Uh, the, who sponsors the news? Pfizer, Moderna, right? Who is who? Eli Lilly. Who are the sponsors of the news? That's you know. So Noam Chomsky taught us, right? That's how they control the news. The ownership. Right. And that's what it is. So now that's that's who f pays the bills. You know, when Chuck Todd goes to do a fact checking segment and it's sponsored by Boeing, a defense contractor, I don't think I'm getting the facts. So that's what that's again. This is this is my theory. <laughs> well, I can't think of a better one. OK, last question. Where's this go? Like the media communication information news landscape of which almost against your will, you're now a part. Where does that go? What, what do you mean where does it, where are well, we gonna end up? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you have a mass vaccination, just to name one among many examples, but a mass vaccination campaign where people literally can't get an education without getting the vaccine, whether they need it or not. So it affects everybody. Yeah. Every, every family's touched by this. And you're not even allowed to say out loud what the, what the side effects are. Like that's not a system that you can keep in place forever. That just doesn't, that's not workable over time. So what replaces it? Boy, uh, I don't know, but it, it does. I don't. I don't that's see, dark ages. Stuff. I don't see this stuff changing because they're still talking about Trump. You know what I'm saying? There's still the establishment left is still trying to make everything about Trump and the, his followers and how scary they are. And they're still propping up Fauci. How is Fauci not in jail? I don't understand I, this. I've guy. asked that question myself. I mean, it's not. I mean, but you can't even say anything bad about him because people will go, well, you, you're a crazier. No, this guy's the crazy. He's a liar. I'll prove it to you. So I, I don't see think I don't see it getting better. I think this is a system they're going to try to sustain forever. I mean, I, I don't things aren't going things aren't getting better. I, no. I don't mean to be a, a Debbie Downer, but well, it, um, what do we disagree on? You and me. I'm extremely pro-life. Oh, okay. Very. I just think abortion's horrible, so sad, awful. And uh, so probably that. Okay. Yeah, we do disagree on that, I guess. So, but, but you're consistent, whereas you're against killing people who are alive, too, right? Yeah, I am. Yeah. Big time. Right. So that's... Yeah, big time. So yeah, very much against I just met a guy who's a fan of mine who's an evangelical Christian, and he said he's for open borders. And I said, why? And he said, because I believe in the Bible. And I was like, what? You know, I'm like, I've never heard of evangelical Christian. And so how do you, what do you say to that? Like, what do you say to like, if, as a Christian, we have to treat certain people, we can help them and not. And, well, how did that funnel into your immigration? My view on immigration is that it's a government function. Our church is, is not a theocracy. The church doesn't run the country. And governments are defined by their borders. Citizenship is, is if you're gonna have nation states, and maybe we don't, maybe we just have one big country controlled by one government. Seems like a bad idea to me. But if we're going with our current system where each country is a separate country and represents its own people and has an mm -hmm. obligation to do that, mm -hmm. then you've got to represent your own people. And by own people in this country, this is, this is a multiracial country, always has been, it's not defined by the race or even the language of the people who live here. That means all people, no matter what they look like. The, the distinction is, are you a citizen or not? That's the only meaningful distinction for the American government. Now, as, as a human being and a Christian, I have different... You know, I have different obligations. So if there's someone from a foreign country comes and says, I, I need help, I don't say, oh, you're not an American citizen. I'm not going to help you. That's irrelevant to me, but I'm not the government. The government exists to help its citizens. There's no other reason to have a government. And so you have to make distinctions. And so if you want Medicare for all, you can't have open borders because the entire world will show up. Why wouldn't they? And I wouldn't blame them. I often say this in my show. I don't blame anyone in Guatemala for moving here. I would too, immediately. Me too. Of course so they're the last people I blame. But if you want to give a good life to your people, you have to keep it to your people. That's why you're the government. That's like, it's, it's intrinsic. It's inherent to the system. Um, and if there's another system that you think might work, I'd love to hear it. I just have never heard of it. And so anyway, so my view is it's just super simple. It's about citizenship. And if second citizenship doesn't matter, then you're incapable of helping your people. And so like, why have a government? You know what I mean? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I see the uh, 
you know, our government creating economic crisis all over the Central America. Yeah. In Mexico, NAFTA hurt those rural farmers. That's why they're all coming. And, you know, it turns into factory farms, too, down there. So they're economic. They're coming here because they're desperate economically. For sure. Right. They're not coming here for the sun. You know what I mean? They're coming no, no, here. they're coming here for, for money. Right. For, econ for economics. Yeah. So the, but yeah. I would say a couple of things. I mean, I've spent a lot of time in Latin America. And one thing I have learned is... Um, you know, this is there's this is very complicated stuff. I think American foreign policy has really hurt a bunch of different countries. I say that all the time. Yes, I mean, of course. It's clearly true. On the other hand, you know, it's one of many reasons these are screwed up countries. A. B, in the case of we're just in El Salvador, for example, one third of all Salvadorans live in the United States. Of all living Salvadorans no live kidding. in the one third. So what do you think that does to El Salvador, actually? It doesn't help El Salvador. Like there's still a country called El Salvador. It's a mountainous country in the middle, most densely packed country in Central America. And like, if all the ambitious people leave, what does it mean for them? Well, I asked the president, he's like, all the people who might be building a robust, happy society here have gone and they're working as housekeepers in Santa Monica. Like, how's that good for us? It's not, it's terrible for us. Same in Syria. I remember the, was it the Bush administration or Obama administration? It's like, oh, all the Syrian doctors are coming. It's so great. Well, that's that. mm -hmm. what, well, what if you still live in Syria? Like, who's going to treat your wounds? Like, I have cancer. Oh, shit. All the doctors are, you know, they're in Chicago. So at a certain point, like, one of my... So what is the controversy about your immigration stance? What do people... I'm a racist! Racist! It's like, don't listen to me because I'm... A... Look, it's a means of social control. As I was saying, we had dinner last night. I'll submit it. As I was saying last night, if I have a bunch of opinions that are very non-mainstream, especially on foreign policy. But my racial opinions are like as mainstream and kind of boring and Dr. Seuss, like we're all created equal by God. I really believe that we're all judged equally under the law. We should be rigorous in enforcing that. The same standard applies to everybody, period. That's the whole point of justice is that it's equally applied, period. And I really believe that as like a core tenant. Like I really believe that. So I always, I was saying to my personal, it's like, why are they, of all the things you can call me, I, I do have some crackpot views, like no doubt. But they have nothing to do with race. Why are they calling me a racist? And he's like, because that's how they get you off the air. That's how they shut you up. And I'm like, and I'm such a literal person. I was like, I don't really? Because I accuse people of things I think they've done wrong. I do. I never attack people for things that, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, but but you, they're accusing me of something. It's like the one sin I haven't committed. Why are they doing that? And it's a tactic. So you would agree, you'd agree the criminal justice system is racist, right? No. I Come think on. that the, well, what does that mean? The system is racist. Well, for instance, it's set up to over-police poor people it's, and incarcerate them at higher rates. Because if you look at who's incarcerated, it's that, like, for instance, there's that study that uh, you're 16 times more likely to be arrested for cocaine if you're black than if you're white, even though they consume it at the same well, rate. The, the powder like versus crack thing is the one place where you'd be like, that had a disparate impact. There's no doubt about it. Um, but I think it's, I mean, I was a p police reporter. I was never, you know, I've always been a civil liberties guy. So anyone with power, whether it's a beat cop or the secretary of defense bears watching. That's just been my view of my whole life. So I think there are abuses. I've seen them of individuals at the hands of the state by cops or anybody else. So I think that's a problem. I've always thought that I think it now, but there are certain neighborhoods for reasons that are not entirely clear, and that it's not just poverty, that are, have way more violence in them than other neighborhoods. I've thought a lot about it. I've written a lot about it. I wrote a book on it, tried to once. I don't really fully understand, but it's still true. And if you pull the police out of those neighborhoods, man, weak people get really hurt. I mean, that's just true. Yeah. And Eric Adams getting elected mayor of New York? Holy, what is that? So here's a black guy who's very liberal and everything and probably corrupt and doesn't even live in New York. He's got all these kind of problems. <laughs> but he's like a legitimate, he's like a black guy. And all the white liberals are like, oh, can't elect him. Why? Because he said exactly what Al Sharpton said, which is defund the police. That's like a Sag Harbor thing. That's like, that's what they think is cool in, you know, what's the, what would be the equivalent in LA? You know, Silver Lake? Yeah, Silver Lake, exactly, thank you. That's like only rich people think that's a good idea. If you're like an actual black person living in a dangerous neighborhood, you probably don't love the cops. I believe that. But pulling them out? Oh, 
Well, no, I, I never thought to fund the police. I guess I had a different interpretation of that. I always thought to fund the police was we're over policing, we're spending too much, certainly in New York, and we could take some of those resources and give it to like social workers. So when you get when a guy's a crazy guy is having a problem, you don't send two cops with a gun. You send a social worker and maybe some guys with a white coat, and you take them to a thing. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Totally. So that's that's that. When I hear defund the police, that's what I hear. I just think. I saw this in Iraq. I, I saw this in Beirut. I saw it during Katrina. The second, you love doing that. You love bragging about all the places. I do. Been, I do. And I here's the one lesson I learned. Here's the one lesson I learned from all the chaos: <laughs> is when chaos happens and no one's keeping charge, anyone with a gun becomes God, and everyone else has to bow down before that person. And usually, it's a young guy with bad judgment, short-term goals, and no regard for other people's suffering and it becomes a freaking hellscape immediately. And you have to, and who, and who gets hurt? It's the weak, the weak get hurt. They, women get raped, people have their shit taken, people get bossed around, it's bad. Like you, that's the one thing you can't have because the weak suffer. Okay, okay. Don't you think? Uh, no, I, I agree with you. Yeah, I definitely have to have police, but I think we need to redo it totally. And I, need, I believe in community-based policing. So right now, when they hire a new police chief, he comes in and he tells everybody how we're going to police your city. No, you should have a citizen board that's going to tell the cops how you're going to police us. Like, for instance, just an example. Hey, when we pick up a kid for curfew, do you want us to arrest him? Do you want us to take us home? Take him home. That would be what we want you to do in our community. We don't let the cop decide. We tell the cops how to do it. I kind of agree with that. So that's what we need. And we need to have the community run. Like the more local control. Yes. And you, and you, and you get down and you, you tell the cops how to police us. You don't let the cops dictate, which is what's happening. They all get their training from Israel and then they come into our cities and they go fucking crazy. I'm sorry. Can I swear? I'm sorry. Yeah. And they all go crazy. Right. So, uh, and then half of them are staffed by ex-military, which is the wrong kind of people to have. And uh, because they're trained to see the people that they're policing as the enemy, not as a, 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 someone to be served. So we need to get back to that service. But I have a bunch of videos on this. I'm very into police reform. And, uh, you know, there's there's aren't people joining the cops with good intentions. Yes. But those people get weeded out or they succumb to the culture. And there's a culture problem with policing in America. And it's not just in one city. It's nationwide and it's cultural. And right, right now I live in Los Angeles. They have the cops who live 50 miles away from where they p patrol. That's wrong. They come in from Canyon Country into the inner city to patrol it. That's wrong. You can't have that. When I lived, grew up in Chicago, my dad had to live in the city if he was going to be a cop. Yep. And that's a great idea. You have to live in the community that you're going to police. That's one big change we should do. So I have a lot of ideas on that. Not just on, I, but they, instead of defund the police, they should call it reinvest the police money, right? That would be, maybe that'd be better because defund does not sound good. It sounds like we can't get rid of police. <laughs> no, <Yeah>. no. <laughs> Jimmy Dore, how, how long did that go? I'm gonna ask my producer. How did we go too long? No, it was an hour and seven minutes. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, you don't need to be sorry at all. That was great. Oh, okay. And I enjoyed the hell out of it. Uh, me too. My pleasure. Thank Thanks you. for having me on. Name of the show is Tucker Carlson Today. New episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on Fox Nation. We'll see you every night at eight on the Fox News Channel.